Uh, I want to thank everyone from Goodall for the opportunity and for their commitment to the growth and development of the F-18 class around the world. Uh, we all know that sailing and specifically high performance catamaran racing is not the biggest market to go after. I think it can go without question that the people making these awesome boats have just as much passion about our sport as the people who race them. I'm humbled you chose the name I suggested for your newest F-18. I hope the suggestion I, an American sailor from the Great Lakes, offered would uniquely meld together the identity of good old designs with the history and culture of their Australian homeland. I know Akura will become a name known throughout the international cat community, and while I am humbled, I'd be lying if I said I'd never flex on some future Akura owner informing them that I named their boat. My position as the social media manager for the US F-18 class has made this unique, unique opportunity even more interesting. 2020 has been a difficult year for the sport with events canceled and a general lack of new content to share. To share the introduction of a new F-18 model is a welcome relief and probably some great free advertising for Goodall. My reach to the thousands of people who follow the US F-18 page leading up to this meeting has what feels like made me the standard bearer for everyone eager to know more about the Acura. In addition to my own, I bring some of their questions here and I look forward to sharing the, to sharing what I learned with all of them. Thank you, James. Really, really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, cool. Um, well, I'll take the opportunity to introduce the guys that we've got here now as well. Um, we've got Laurent uh, Verbe out in uh, Belgium. So he's uh, sitting down looking at a winter as well. Laurent's responsibility is basically head, he's the commercial director, which basically means that he runs everything in terms of marketing, uh, distribution, working with deals, working with customers, um, and all of that side of things. Um, and a few years ago, we shifted all of that management to Europe uh, to be more uh, central to the main market and increase our response times. Um, then sitting next to me, We've got the grandfather himself, Greg Goodall, um, who from a day-to-day -day basis on the design side of things is probably less hands-on than he used to be, but he definitely babysits me and makes sure I don't mess anything up. <laughs> so, um, even, Everybody needs a supervisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, some, some of the design barnies or, or disputes that we have are um, interesting. <laughs> so, that's who we've got at the table now. Okay, so probably, I guess, the, the, the point to start is timeline it in terms of when we decided to do a new boat and the process we go through. Um, the, pretty much from the time we put a, a design on the water, we start thinking about the next one. It's just, I guess, an instinctual part of, of what we do and, and always looking to improve. Um, I guess for the, for the first couple of years of a new design, you're always thinking about what can we do to improve this design? Um, and around that becomes system setup, um, rig, uh, foil location, if you really want to start changing hulls. Um, but that happens for about the first three or four years. Um, well, that happens continuously. Um, but after about four years, you start really thinking about, look, if we're going to sit down and design a new hull, what, what are we going to do? um what what changes could we make um unfortunately that didn't really happen with the c2 because we were just always really really blown away at how fast it was going how well it was performing throughout the range um it didn't really seem to have any achilles heels of where it really fell apart um probably for the last two years we've been starting to really look at where we could improve it um and then we sort of started to, to brainstorm that out and then at the start, to give credit to give credit to the C2, it is uh, definitely one of the most popular boats that we see in the Michigan fleet. Yeah, of the F18 class. Yeah, it it, se it seems to to cover the range incredibly well. And when we step from the C2, sorry, from the Capricorn to the C2, um, the changes were pretty obvious in terms of, of volume and, and shape and things like that. And there was always that you always have that little voice in the back of your head when you start adding adding volume and and, and just boofness to a boat you're like well what's going to be the trade-off obviously the thing's going to be more buoyant but is it going to trade off and, and suffer in the light and we sort of we were just consistently blown away that that never seemed to be a, a trade-off so we um we, we sort of i guess all of those little things you learn from um but when we sat down to do the 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 um the the akura 
um, we sort of created a bit of a short list of what we could improve. And it, it was a short list that was sort of a case of, there, there wasn't a huge amount of improvements, but basically one of the things that we wanted to improve was it, its weight carrying capabilities. Um, I think over the last 10 years of the lifespan of the C2, the average, average crew weight has gone up um, probably about five or 10 kilos. Um, where, you, where you're seeing, uh, yeah, crews closer to the sort of the 160, 165 on average um, sailing. Um, and that, yeah, look, it didn't, wasn't a bad thing for the C2, but one of the things we noticed was just the, the how the boat sat in the water. Um, so what we've done from the seat to the Acura is we've added a little bit more volume in the back end of the boat. Um, and really what we want to do is, is basically in the, in the lighter and the more puffy condition, lift up the transom and, and improve the, the flow and the runoff in the back. Um, to offset that, we've increased the front volume a tiny bit because you can't, you don't want to be lifting the back of the boat and, and not doing this, a similar thing with the front. You can, you can tend to have a little bit more of a nose heavy boat in that, that situation. Um, we've changed the keel line. So the, the, we've decreased the keel line slightly, which in the, the theory behind that is that it increases the, the terminal velocity of the hull, so the, the potential high speed of the hull. Um, and that's always a little bit of a, uh, a juggling act between decreasing your, your keel line or your rocker um, and maintaining your volume because you start taking out a small amount of rocker and your volume decreases very, very rapidly. So you've got to play this back and forth balancing game to make, make everything uh, balance out. So are you basically talking about making it straighter or along the bottom of the hull? Correct, correct. So basically, if you look at the side of the boat, which... Oh, I don't know. It's not going to work. <laughs> that doesn't work. No, it doesn't work at all. It doesn't see it as a face. I've got a small model here. But um, yeah, so basically the rocker is if you were to sit the boat on solid ground, how much it rocks four and a half. And yeah, I follow. Like that. So like a, a boat with a lot of rocky, you tend to be able to, to get bow up, bow down, bow up, bow down. Or something like with, a Hobie 16. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, it's something with zero rocker. You tend to be very locked into your, your position and, and not having a huge amount of fore aft um, uh, trim ability. Um, but obviously having something with a lot of rocker, it, it works like an upside down airplane wing where the, the water's got to flow from the, the bow tip to the transom. It's got to go around this big old bend. And the more rocker you have in there, the more drag that it induces over the hull. Um, Interesting. Through both, through both skin and uh, skin friction and pressure friction or pressure drag. So obviously the, the pressure drag being like what you're saying about it, comparing it to an airplane wing. Yeah. Yeah. So it creates a small amount of down pressure, which pulls the boat down into the water as well. So having lots of rocker in a, a pure hydro, hydrodynamic sense is not a good thing. Um, but then you got to balance that out with how, how the boat trims and how the boat sails where the, 40 or 50 odd years of catamaran, catamaran experience in next me tends to sort of keep us in line with that one. Um, so yeah, we, we decrease the rocker a little bit to basically to improve the, the top speed of the hull. Um, we also put a little bit of concavity into the back of the, the back transom, which sort of was a fashion with the last America's Cup boats and things like that. And the idea is that it improves the, the direct flow um, off, the, off the transom. Um, we were careful not to put too much in because if you start putting concavities into flow lines, you can get sort of vortices and, and weird things happening mm -hmm. um, close to the surface. So, look, if you, you you can spot it if you look at it very, very, very closely. And if you're straight edge, you can see that it's in there, but it's not not as pronounced as some of the other designs around. Uh, we we're, were sort of pretty careful on that. Um, moving forwards, obviously, you've in all the... Um, Renderings, you can see that the front um, fore deck and everything's pretty chined up. Um, besides the fact that it looks really awesome, um, it really does help break um, waves. So any chop, any waves, anything that you do, any waves that you start pumping into, the, the the water shedding over that's fantastic. Um, we were a little bit blown away when we did it to the Viper. How it, when we took the Viper on, it was a lot more of a cosmetic update, but the the, the effect of it 
sort of dipping and slicing through waves was, was actually really noticeable. So we made a, a concerted effort to really amplify that on the, the Acura. Hmm. Um, the Daggerboard. Daggerboard is the same as the upgrade to the C2, which we did a couple of years ago. So, really? so the C2 Daggerboard originally was 220 millimeters for aft. Then we changed that down to a 195. Um, so it was quite a significant uh, chord change. Um, and we also moved the dagger boards forward at that stage in the C2. Um, so we changed, so we kept that dagger board um, and we kept the position and we changed the rudder. So the rudder being, there was a number of things I'll go into in a second. The rudder was, um, we we're very, very happy with the rudder in both section and in sort of physical dimensions, but we knew there was improvements there, um, both cosmetically and also probably more importantly, um, performance-wise. Um, and you'll, you'll see, actually, no, none, of the, none of the rending, sorry, none of the renderings we've released have shown it, but the rudder now, instead of coming up uh, horizontally, will actually hold up vertically. So um, but coming into, coming in on beaches and things, get it completely out of the water. So it'll do a full 180 flip or slide right. up? No, they're okay. 180 feet. Yeah. Uh, same, same lockdown mechanism um, because that's hands down the most positive lockdown mechanism that we've ever seen. Um, hmm. So we're, we're definitely not, not changing that. Um, it, the whole design system works really well. It releases under the right amount of pressure and everything. So you do run aground. So rudder and transom damage is very, very, very rare. In fact, I can't think of anything in the last. Uh, I'm sure time. it'll look good on land with the rudder sticking up. Yeah, yeah. And you know what was really funny is when it first started happening on some other designs, it was one of the things that people looked at and went, oh, gee, that's in the way, that's ugly, people are going to catch ropes and stuff on it. Now it's kind of like it's the new fashion. So um, besides using I think, blue, I think I think as an aesthetic, blue. it looks cool on, on land, and you say catching ropes and stuff, at least people won't be kicking your rudders walking around the beach. Yeah. Well, there's a story of old um, Rod Waterhouse at Texel. Um, I, I know he's a well-known name out, at, um, out in the USA. Um, do you know, have you heard of Rod? Rod who? Waterhouse. Uh, I don't know the name off the top of my head. Um, Hobie, Hobie Grandfather, just absolute superstar, well-known. He won the Warrell last year. He's... Um, okay. He, he, on his hit list for many years had been to do um, the round Texel. And he, he'd come down there with us one year and he had a, he'd actually borrowed a wildcat because he's a hobby man from way back. And he um, was walking around the boat and kicked the, the rudder when it was down with no boots on, put a massive gash up the inside of his foot, cut his web, the webbing in his foot, foot and everything. Mm. And um, still ended up doing the, the round Texel with, like stitches in his feet and there's no way on earth he should have been on the water but <laughs> he's not going to pass up the, the opportunity that he's been been aiming for for years so ever since that i was always very very careful around around riders seeing the damage that they can do especially with the carbon trailing edges now um but back on track um the rudder itself when obviously the Looking for efficiency, you're always looking at the higher aspects. So you're looking at long and thin. But the thing that the feedback from a lot of the top end sailors was that our rudder was fantastic at very, very low speed. So on the start line, you could pump the boat up, pump the bows up and down, left and right, and sort of tend to force the boat into acceleration mode or storm mode and, and be able to work on other boats. Um, and that feedback came from like the likes of Frank Camus and Glenn Ashby and, and guys like that that have spent time on the boat. So we really didn't want to go, uh, we, we didn't want to go just go blindly super thin and super efficient because we'd lose that, that fanning ability. So what we've done is the head of the rudder on the waterline is the same fore aft that it was with the old rudder, but the rudder itself tapers down, it's about 80 millimeters longer, but it tapers down much more to a pointed end at the tip. And has hmm. a, a much much better um, vortex shedding um, bottom tip as well. Okay. So um, we sort of looking at maintaining flow over the rudder. We kept the same section because it's been it sticks like oh, I can't say because we're recording, but it, it sticks really really well. <laughs> um, it's, pretty, it's pretty rare to have to have the rudders unstick or stall out. So we're, we we weren't going to change that. 
Um, well, that's the, probably the, the, the hulls and the foils are the, the biggest obvious change that people see. Um, and I mean, as far as a new design, that's, that's the, the monumental steps forward. There's, there's not many other opportunities because we're always developing rigs and sails and, and systems. So there is a, yeah. a, a few other systems and improvements that we're, we're, we're tinkering with and we're going to, we're going to play with during prototyping. Um, the jibs obviously come down. Uh, with deck sweepers, we get to improve efficiency between between the slot and run the, um, yeah, basically run flow better over that bottom section of the, the new deck sweepers. So that's a, I guess, a standard practice. Um, we definitely think that there's improvements around the bottom of the deck sweeper with systems. Um, so we're going to be playing with things like that. Um, the sort of around mass rotation, Cunningham system, um, and all of those sort of things. So um, at the moment, is, we've got a, a sort of a long list of theories and things that we want to test. Um, but look, until, until we test it on the water, where they're things that we sort of, you tend to get a little bit ambitious and try completely radical things because the, the cost of it failing is pretty low, whereas the cost of a hull failing is pretty high. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if I missed anything in the entire list of. Oh, the rear beams come up a little bit. Sorry, to cut right off there. The rear beams been popped up just a smidgen, um, just to help with. <laughs> they call it pig rooting in Australia, where the thing just gets the, the big jerks on. Um, but we'll, um, yeah, just when it's start the rear beam starts slapping into waves and things like that. So we've lifted that okay. up. A minute amount, but that's a, a minor minor touch up. <laughs> what, do, what have you? Uh, look, probably visually looking at the boat, apart from picking up the, the the difference in shape in the bow and the foredeck area, that's the most obvious one. The other one that people pick will be just the size of the transom. In the building the volume into the back of the boat, did a couple of things. The um, the, the transom size increased, and that's visually obvious. And that was just to make the boat more user-friendly in sailing. So it's a little bit harder to press the boat when the crew's out the back of the boat downwind and the breeze drops out a little bit. It, it won't have that tendency to want to sink the transom so easily. So okay. it'll be a bit more forgiving in that area. Um, the, the size of the transom went up as much as it did because of that little bit of concavity in the, in the back of the boat as well. Because if you, as you put concavity into the aft section of the hull, near the transom there, the thing that really has becomes noticeable is how much volume and buoyancy you lose out of the boat. Um, we first saw that happen, oh, I'll go back now, probably 10, 15 years ago on some of the A-class that had concavity in the back of them. Um, the theory says that it reduces drag, but in actual fact, that doesn't quite work as simply as that because then the transom wants to sink really quickly, sink the transom and you've got enormous drag. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it's one thing to say, yes, in the perfect world tank testing or simulation, there's no more drag, but in practice, because of that lack of volume in the back end of the boat, it becomes very critical about where you stand. So we didn't want to fall into that trap. So um, we've got the extra size and volume in the transom, a little bit of concavity to reduce the drag. And that will become obvious when you look at the boat. The, the positive offshoot of that as a side to that was the fact that the deck at the back of the boat became a little bit wider and that gave a bit more stiffness to the boat, which had a bigger um, beam landing platform. And, um, and that was actually some of the other changes they've made to the boat on the technical side. The, the hull's much stiffer, the foam core's a bit thicker, the laminate's been um, built up in certain areas to add extra stiffness because there's a bit of extra weight to play with that they could um, put into um, just structural integrity in the boat. Yeah. So that was basically the hull side of um, my side of it these days, which is predominantly the sail design area. Um, we've done a lot of work in the last two years on main sails. So we've got those pretty well dialed in. Same with the spinnakers. There's no real major change we're doing there, but the the jib was probably the, the next biggest change we did because the the bridle height has been reduced uh, or the apex of the bridle has been dropped by about 130 millimetres, um, which is quite noticeable. Um, so we've had to change the, 
the um, configuration of the jib a little bit. We need to keep the clue in the same position because of the um, balance between leech tension and foot tension. And um, in the process of doing that, it's changed the, the look of the jib. But the lowering of the jib does two things. It improves the center of effort and it also in, improves uh, the flow over the bottom part of the deck sweeper. So that it always becomes more efficient, more power, more writing moment on it, on that center of effort being lower. Um, basically it all adds up to a fractionally better performance and speed. I, the, the changing of the apex of the bridles down, I remember that there was a vote on the class rules not too long ago, but I don't remember the specifics of it. Um, was, it was that related to anything there? Uh, yeah, look, they were debating whether or not they would allow the, the jib to be, um, the, sorry, the pack of the jib to be lower than the apex of the bridle. So in other words, right. the, the jib would come all the way down to, say, the spinnaker pole. Um, that basically was a Pandora's box because then you come into the realms of how do you stop people trying to create deck, deck sweepers or, or a, um, an end plate effect with the spinnaker chute or the jib. And suddenly there was a whole thing happening and then the cool heads eventually prevailed and said well the current rule is pretty clear and is not creating too many problems people are lowering the apex of the bridle to get the benefits we want by putting the front chain plate positions lower in the hull and you can see that on the um, scorpion you can you'll see it on the new one um, the capricorn and the and the C2 are probably one of Okay, the so problems. it was more of a competitive arms race to lower the apex of that yeah, bridle, long bridle long long as long opposed long to any changes. Yeah, correct, correct. yeah that's correct. The, the lowering of the, of the apex of the bridle brings in a few benefits, and um, it just depends how you do it. You can um, have a very uh, flat, um, I suppose, uh, not sure what bridle. you call it, yeah, very flat bridle, but that puts enormous pressure inwards on the hull. So you've got to have a really high hull stiffness to stop the hulls deflecting inwards. So there's a limit on how flat you can make that bridle arrangement, but it's, it can also be lowered down the hull. So we did a combination of both. We lowered the, the um, front chain plate position on the hull by approximately, I think, 100 millimetres. 70, 75. 75 millimetres. And then we flattened off the um, angle of the apex of the, of the bridle a little bit because we'd already experimented with that on the C2. And just the fact that the whole stiffness has been improved over the last couple of years in construction meant that we didn't have a problem with being um, a little bit flatter on the angle. Um, just to throw in one, a really relevant question that I got, uh, Ben Denworth from Ferndale, Michigan asked, do you have a quantification for the stiffness of a beach cat and was there anything designed into the Acura specifically regarding its stiffness? I, I know you already spoke uh, to the widening of the near the transom that allowed a better pla place, to, um, more capability to uh, secure the rear crossbar. Generally speaking, um, you... <laughs> You, there's not a like a clear quantification in terms of this is a six stiffness and that's a eight stiffness. Um, it's sort of oversimplifying it, but you, we do know that there are um, a number of different elements that create a stiff boat, um, and that's well, look, it, it, you have panel stiffness, which is basically um, we've, we've improved that by going up a gauge in our core thickness, um, which is basically the stiffness of the panels that the hull's made of and then by making those panels not straight um like a, if you look at a straight or a flat single single curve then you're decreasing the stiffness by having compound curves you, you naturally increase the stiffness of the the, the panel um, so all of these little things you're always taking into consideration and by making the the hull bigger just in terms of volume and, and separating your, your inner skin and your, your outer skin you make, you're naturally making the boat stiffer. So you're always aiming for the stiffest boat you can build. Um, so basically every decision you make is how stiff can we make this? <laughs> um, and that's all like into it. And that goes all the way down from when you're CAD modeling the whole shape. Um, once you get above the waterline, you start, that becomes a, a more and more and more critical. Um, hmm, sort of like with the, the, the rear beam landing, 
one of the things Greg didn't mention with that is we were pretty keen on keeping that um, quite wide. So the I think we're about um, 50 millimetres wider at the rear beam than we were on the occur than we were on the C2. Um, and yes, that's stiffness, but it's also riding moment. So if you're mm. using it the rear beam, you're actually 25 millimetres or 50 millimetres taller. <laughs> so Interesting. It, one of the things that we started to sort of just little things like that, that the as you go through the evolution process, you know, it pops up. Um, but in terms of going back to stiffness, um, yeah, then when you start writing your, um, your, your laminate schedule, you start sort of analyzing how the boat's going to twist, where it's going to, um, or how it's going to twist, how it's going to bend, um, and start putting the right fibers in what the right direction in those sort of places, obviously main loads around the main beam and centerboard case locations, um, and where you want to patch and where you want to have overlaps and all of that sort of stuff. So you you start to sort of create a bit of a recipe of, of what works and I mean, very rarely do things not work, but you sort of go, okay, well that worked a little bit, but let's improve it. So so um, it's kind of like you're using your knowledge of what makes a boat stiff and try to maximize those within the parameters, within the other parameters that make the boat go fast. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But the, I guess the, the, the crux of it is, is the stiffer, the faster. Um, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's that simple. There's no such thing as a boat that's not stiff enough. You know, it's impossible <laughs> to make it too stiff. I remember a couple of years back, there was a, a, a discussion going around on one of those forums. It might have been on the even the F-18 forum or something. And people were discussing with, whether a boat being stiff was critically important. And it was a bit of back and forth. And a few people were saying, oh, yeah, but having some flex might be good. And eventually people like Darren Bundock chimed in with all his experience. He came back with the statement, there is no such thing as a boat that's too stiff. Oh, that's funny. They'd learned that from the tornadoes and every other, um, you know, high performance cat that's ever been produced. Stiffness is actually almost the, the, the holy grail of, um, you know, catamaran sailing in as far as the design aspect of what you're trying to achieve. A stiff boat will always beat a flexible boat. Um. Kind of very another really related question. Uh, Brian Horkery from Coons Lake, Indiana asks, what are the materials and construction used to make the Acura? Is it a fiberglass uh, foam composite or yeah. wasn't there a, was there a class rule that allowed uh, other materials recently? Yeah, the, well, yes, there is a class rule and the class rule basically says that it can only be used as PVC, well, I think you're allowed to use PVC foam, balsa wood, and there may be something else in there, but you're certainly not allowed to use um, honeycomb like Nomex. Nomex is um, illegal. Um, uh, there's also some styrene foams that are, can be used, but they're also illegal. So they've, they've focused on keeping the cost of construction down. So right. uh, carbon fiber is banned. Um, so you can really only build out of um, uh, fiberglass but you can choose between epoxy, polyester, or vinyl ester resins. Um, the best choice- I think that's what the change was, yeah. was, was what, yeah. I, what I was thinking about of the, yeah. of the uh, yeah. adhesive used with the fiberglass. Yeah. The, ch the change to epoxy was, was a really positive step forward for the class. Um, right. I think the real, technically from a purely engineering point of view, you, you end up with a, a slightly stiffer boat new, but what you end up with is a boat that doesn't degrade over time. So um a, a five-year-old boat in epoxy is going to be notably stiffer than a five-year-old boat in vinyl ester and uh sorry if i missed it you said the the acura went with epoxy yeah so the so okay. the um the, all of the last c2s were built out of epoxy as well i think maybe okay. the last 50 or so we shipped we shifted to that as soon as we knew that the rule was coming in um because we had that ability the bark was already produced out of epoxy it was a a pretty simple changeover for us Probably the other um, thing that we haven't touched on at all about the uh, production is that the Acura is coming out with a paint option. Oh, really? So we, there was a long, long discussions about pros, cons, ifs and buts and maybes, but basically the, the concept with paint is it gives you the ability to make a boat that's a kilo or two lighter. Um, and until the first ones come out, I sort of really don't want to put a, a huge number on, on that. But the theory is, is the paint's lighter. Um, 
And huh. the second thing is you get a choice of color and finish. So the, we're not sitting down to the standard boats um, gel coat. That'll always be gel coat. But we have the ability to do a painted boat to any color that you like with any finish. Is it what what type of? I'm assuming it's a very durable paint. I guess what I was yeah. where I was going with that. Well, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of options with the paint because of our our builder. Um, we we have access to all, all of the marine paints, the all part craft, the um, Durapox, all that. They have the experience with that, um, and they're willing to sort of take each case um, as it comes and customize that to the the customer's, I guess, wishes. So if they say I want to all craft lime green they're going to get the the all craft lime green but if they come out and they say i want a durapox rail orange then that's what they get so yeah. i can see your eyes lighting up there james you're obviously thinking about all the graphic designs you can do in the paint jobs you could be <laughs> highly in demand for uh <laughs> Um, well, well, actually, I had uh, two really relevant questions on this. Uh, Peter Yates from, I'm probably going to butcher this, uh, Adelaide, South Australia, asked um, if black anodizing would be an option to complement the paint colors. Um, yes. Short answer is yes, but <laughs> the, the long answer is that everything gets um, anodized sort of in production from well, in the extrusion process so it gets extruded anodized and shipped to us all in the same same batch so to do a one-off uh black um and it's not the black anodizing is any more difficult it would require us to extract that that beam get it refinished re-anodized reshipped and back to us so um everything's possible um <laughs> it just may not be um even if we do it at cost it may not be a cost that the customer is willing to 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 cover um, and then another one concerning the color. I was actually going to save this question for last, but uh, Daryl Flanagan, I'm sure you guys know that name, uh, yeah. from Hobart, uh, Tasmania, asked, will you make one in gold asking for a friend? <laughs> it's just here. <laughs> yeah. Does he want it gold plated or does he just want it gold colored? <laughs> I'll... I'll let you guys in his bank account sort that one out. <laughs> no, 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 Darren, quite well. well. We'll make him any color he wants to pay for. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, yeah. A any other questions you've got? Shoot. So I think we're probably talked out a little bit. So. Open slather to you, I think, James. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got a couple of my own and a couple more from uh, from other people. Um, I'll try to sift through the ones that I have that have already been answered. Um, uh, this one is curiosity of mine. Um, I, a while back, I did a bunch of research as, as to the different um, make and models of the many different manufacturers over the years. Um, and... To my understanding, AHPC Goodall started prototyping the F-18 class with a modified Taipan 5.7 around 96, which went on to win the round Texel race in 98. Why did your company not pursue the F-18 class further until Martin Fisher approached you with his Capricorn platform? Uh, that better, better be one for me to answer because that goes back <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know if you were going to be on, and I was wondering if I was going to be talking with uh, the current generation of the company <laughs> that might not know the, the answer to that. Yeah. Okay, the, the Taipan 5.7 was um, basically 200 millimeters longer than a, um, a, a legal F-18, so to produce the, the modified Taipan, it was a case of um, taking a little bit off the transom, a little bit off the bow. It was a, <laughs> a one-off production boat and, and that's what i asked oh, from what i researched that's what i gathered yeah so the it was it was just a i suppose tipping our toe in the water <laughs> to see whether or not you know that it would be something we'd be interested in doing and the answer came back that yes it would but it but we weren't going to get serious about it until we'd actually build a a mold for the boats now all the, building a mold for a new hull shape as a you know, major capital investment and time investment. And at that particular moment, we were pretty heavily involved in A-class production and uh, okay. 5.9 and 5.7 production. So it's sort of 
And, uh, and F-18 at the time was a very, very new class, you know, 96. Um, it had only been around for about 12, 18 months as a concept yeah. in the class. Um, probably one of the things at the time with that Taipan 57 that was absolutely years ahead of everyone else's thinking was the wing mast section. That Taipan 57 used the same mast section that we currently use on the um, C2 now. And it's the same mass section that virtually everyone has copied since it uh, came out. In 2004, when we did the, the um, Capricorn that Martin Fisher was involved with in us, um, that was one of the things that um, was very new to the class. And people had experimented with it before, but they never quite got the, the mass sail combination to match up. And, um, and, and hence, that the, the people hadn't been aware of the benefit of the of the rig development, but we'd seen it in Taipan 49's A class and in the Taipan 57 that it gave a significant advantage. But um, so that was all part of it. So so the investment into a new hull shape, right, didn't really come about until um, we were approached by Martin Fisher and they so all were provided built, one. <laughs> built a mold uh, which they were using in um, Umea to, and they produced, I think, two boats. And we actually did a trip over to Mumia, uh, sailed on them and said, yeah, look, that all looks pretty good. Um, I, I don't, I'm trying to remember, I, I'm not sure if Jim actually, Jim Boyer was involved in the business with AHPC at that stage as a, as a boat builder. Um, and I think we looked at the boat and Jim looked at the moulds and decided that those moulds weren't suitable for production. Um, but what we did do is we took a, a a plug out of the, that mould, modified it a little bit. We changed the, a couple of minor things in the hull shape because again, once they'd done the prototype, you know, it was pretty good. Um, and we made a few minor changes. Jim made new moulds and in 2003, 2004, we became fully involved in the F-18 class with the Capricorn. Interesting. That's uh, that's been a question I've kind of wondered uh, looking at uh, that whole history. Um, and uh, as manufacturers of both F-18s and F-16s, do you feel that the sport and or industry is strengthened by manufacturers building to box rules as opposed to one design classes? Uh, I, can yes. answer, I can answer that one in one simple word, yes. <laughs> I think F-16 and F-18 is the best thing that's ever happened to off the beach catamaran sailing. It's brought the entire beach catamaran community together, right? Whereas before there was the, the NACRA camp, there was the Hobie camp, there was right. the AHPC camp. Um, there was, it was a fragmented and quite tribal situation. Whereas when F-18 brought them all together, everyone suddenly realized, well, we're all in the, in the one big tribe of the tribes called um, catamaran sailing. So that was a very, very unifying move. And um, yeah, uh, 100% support the F-18, F-16 concept. Yeah, I, I've had a lot of really interesting conversations with um, people who have been around the my home club, the Catamaran Racing Association of Michigan, about how it, it used to be Hobie centric. And then like, uh, I think it was a NACRA dealer got really involved with it and got every a bunch of people to switch over to NACRAs. And then the Hobie guys left and, then it's, yeah, your tribal is a very good way to put it. Um, and, uh, and, and you're right. We're all in this together. Um, I, I work with a lot of people around the country uh, trying to promote the F-18 class. And, and uh, the thing I, I try to tell them is, you know, it's, it's not, even though we want to promote F-18 class, you know, work with the Hobie guys, work with whoever's out there because uh, the more we work together, the more we make the sport better. It's interesting as a, as a manufacturer, we, we, although it's, it always shakes me a little bit when you see somebody come out with a new, new design and, and push the boundaries, it always sort of, is a bit of a wake up call to, oh, okay, we can't relax too much, but <laughs> it's, it, it's always a good thing. Every time you see some, somebody come out with something new, um, no matter who the manufacturer, it always sees growth in the class. So the more strong manufacturers we have in these um, joint box wall classes, the better it is for the class. That uh, your response actually plays right into my next question. Uh, 
as F-18 max manufacturers, has there ever been anything that has surprised ha has surprised you concerning the growth and development of the class? Mm. Dex Wipa. <laughs> That's a fair answer. <laughs> um, I, 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 look, um, it, it might sound a little bit um, short-sighted and, and obnoxious, but I think we were probably the first of the, the main manufacturers to fully develop and push the deck sweeper on, in the bigger picture. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely weren't the first to put it on. Um, I think the first one I saw was Stevie Bruin. Um, oh, yeah. you know, Stevie, Stevie did it here in Australia um, and it was a, it, it wasn't right um, and really didn't <laughs> put any heads. Um, then Misha did the one at the Worlds that he, that was notably faster across everything. Um, I didn't attend those Worlds and got the reports from Laurent and the guys that were there and we immediately sat down and reevaluated our stance on whether it'll work or not and <laughs> it started designing some things very, very quickly. Um, and yeah, that was, that was, Look, it was a complete surprise because the numbers that we ran early on when we first, when the concept first started bouncing around from A class and Stevie, we, we were very, probably a little bit quick to dismiss it. Um, and then we, um, yeah, and then when we started doing the numbers and actually doing some some work on the, the, the solid design, we kind of reevaluated and stepped forward pretty well. And it was <laughs> quite a surprise, but I think it's been a fantastic step. Yeah, yeah we can uh, yeah, on that note, we could. Um, quite clearly see the advantage on the foiling A class why the deck sweep was uh, would work so well because the center of effort was lower and you wanted to keep the boat very flat while you were sailing it. Um, mm -hmm. So lower center of effort, you know, more control over it with your body weight on trapeze. But on an F-18, it was quite important to be able to pop a hull early and be just sailing on one hull. So basically you, you've got 10, 15 degrees of heel. And um, we thought, well, with the deck sweeper, What's the advantage? You, you're actually losing that advantage to pop a hole, but in truth, it didn't quite work that way. All the other things came into it, you know, lower end plate uh, turbulence because you've got the deck sweeper, center of effort being lower, which certainly helps in anything over, say, eight knots of breeze. Um, longer luff length, which actually um, is a, a benefit. Um, there's a whole lot of things that um, actually became very obvious to us once we started experimenting with it ourselves. So yeah, we were, um, like Brett said, a bit dismissive to the idea of a deck sweeper working as well as it did on a F-18. <laughs> but the other thing that came out of it is that when we actually started producing the, um, the deck sweepers, there was quite a lot of background information that had been, that filtered through from A-class things about how deep the sail could be in the bottom part of the sail, um, how big the head had to be, what the roach was like, um, it was, and um, also from A class, we actually could see the development they done as how you actually make the deck sweeper work. I mean, some of the deck sweepers that we'd seen around were quite ugly in the bottom. There was lots of um, tension creases and the sail didn't sit very well. So, you know, we could look at that, see what the better people, or the, the more experienced and um, evolved uh, sails looked like in the bottom part. And then there was also the debate about a boom or boomless deck sweeper. Um, oh gosh. Stevie, Stevie Bruin in particular had been experimenting with a boomless um, sail. And then other people had, um, like Misha had used a, a boom on the sail, a curved boom. And so we had to sort of sort that one out. And there was also the engineering of how you actually connect the boom to the mast and still have it all work. And yeah, so there's quite a lot in it. And we probably spent a pretty torrid 12 months, you know, getting all the bugs sorted out of the whole program. Was there uh, any tweaks to the mass profile to complement the switch to the deck, deck sweeper? No, no um, in actual fact, for us with the C2, the, uh, the deck sweeper was probably a, a bit of a, a, a positive thing to, to match our mast and sail together. The C2's got a slightly softer mast than most others. Right? So if you look at all the different sections that are around, there's, there's several of them. Um, uh, and they're all very similar in physical dimension, roughly 75 millimetres um, wide um, sideways, and then four and a half, they're all about 150 millimetres four and a half. But the stiffness is very um, quite noticeably. Um, but going to a deck sweeper, um, our mast, which was 
bordering on maybe a little bit too soft. Um, it takes a lot of the, the load out of the rig, and certainly the bending load out of the rig because the, the sail's um, thinner and um, or narrower in higher aspect ratio, and there's a lot right. more sail area right down low, so less bending effort goes into the mast. So it's effectively made the, the C2 mast appear noticeably stiffer um, <laughs> with the um, deck sweeper on it. And because of that, and we're also conscious that over the years and years of testing, our experience showed that on the C2 or the sails and mast combinations we were doing, having a, a, a mast that was a bit on the stiff side actually became a, a hindrance, not a, an asset. Um, good in light to medium weather, but it certainly had its limitations in heavy weather. And some of the fastest rigs we'd ever seen in F18 were actually quite soft masts, not just the um, um, the C2 mast, but they, uh, there was the, the boat, the shockwave that came out of um, England and France with Eve today and Robert White, um, who was involved in, they ran a very soft mast. And that, that particular boat and rig was just an absolute weapon in anything over 15 knots. But the problem was, of course, with the soft mast, they had problems. And as soon as it got down to 12 knots, they virtually just didn't have power, couldn't generate performance. So, so we knew there was a limit to how soft you could go. Um, there also appears to be some limit as to how stiff you could go. So um, it's good to get that nice balance. And certainly for us, the, the deck sweeper was, a, 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 I suppose, a, a variation to what we'd been doing that actually worked for us really quite well. So we've kept the same mask. We've still got the same mask that we've, we've been using for the last few years. Okay. Um Will the Acura be built to class weight or intentionally underweight? How much underweight? I <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, target target weight on a finished boat is always sort of in that realm of 177 to 178 kilograms. Yeah. Um, you you never want a boat coming out um, deboxed and and sort of being delivered from a dealer over that 180 kilograms because. By the time it gets sailed half a dozen times, um, picks up little bits of dirt here and there, it gets its compass on there, tow rope, all of those sort of things. A few that's kind of what there. I was wondering. Yeah, they, they, all, they always end up putting on a little bit of weight after their first sail. So, um, yeah, the, the target weight is always that couple of kilos underweight. Um. <laughs> Will the Acura be available for charter at the 2021 Americas in California? I think that's a that's a Laurent answer, that one. <laughs> Get him yeah, we'll talking. We'll, we'll definitely... Do, do you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Yeah, we we will we will definitely look at the options to to um uh, to 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 go for 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 that. I think our aim is to have as many boats as possible around the world and to see to have as many of, of people be possible to try it and to see how it sails and and I'm I'm gonna test it around. So if the possibility is there, we we are definitely keen to to uh, to, to to put a, to put some boats in the U.S. as soon as possible. Okay. Um, I think this one might have kind of been answered, but uh, Jeff Rem of Commerce Michigan asks, what were your objectives in designing the next generation of F-18? I, you spoke a lot about like little tweaks to the hull design, but then a lot of things that you were really happy with the C2 that uh, you brought forward. What, what was the biggest thing that you wanted to change in all of that? I think, to be fair, out of all of it, it, it is as much build quality as it is design. Um, the the tooling we looked at the tooling at the, the boat builders is always kept in really good nick, but at some point there is a, a limit to how long it can it can be perfect. Um, and I think that the tooling for the C two was um, sort of getting to the point where we, we were going to need to do some work to it um, or sort of reevaluate that side of things. So. I think the, the build quality and stiffness that we, we can build into the Acura is, is just that, that real next step for us. Um, new tooling has allowed us to do that. So obviously the, the tooling gets built a little bit different to be able to paint a hull. Um, it gets a slightly different surface on it. So it's going to allow us to experiment with that. 
Um, and th there's also some other things built into the tooling that can allow us over time to experiment with different different configurations and different things. So I think what we're looking for is, is a, is a future-proof platform that really allows us to sort of push forward into the next 10 years of, of development, wherever that goes. So, um, yeah, I think really what we were doing was, was creating a new blank sheet of paper to be able to, to develop everything else. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting answer. I would have never thought about the tooling getting to a point where there's diminishing returns on the product that you offer and, and, and I, like, I think, sorry, to uh, switch, to switch I, to something different is actually benefit beneficial. Yeah, I think so just to be clear on that is there's definitely nothing wrong with the C2 tooling, but it's definitely at the point where to make minor modifications to the design, let's, for example, let's say we want to shift the chain plates the ability to do that becomes quite expensive because you, you're starting gotcha. to deal with, deal with worn tooling and you start doing um, really high new work on something that is um, a little bit older. It's sort of like putting a brand new roof on a beach shack. Um, gotcha. Okay. I misunderstand. I, I thought you were yeah. saying uh, saying something to the effect like after a time molds wear out or something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, they do that too, but <laughs> careful, careful, careful. Um, um, yeah, you look after them. A good maintenance program, which we have, um, keep, keeps all of that pretty, pretty tip top. Yeah. Okay. Um, just going back to the original question, you know, what was the, the design aim that we we're looking at? Probably the biggest factor in what we were thinking about when we we're trying to figure out what to do was to both make the boat easier to sail and more forgiving. Um, I spoke earlier about the idea of the crew on trapeze downwind and the view drop into a lull if the crew's hanging out the back of the boat the transmonts are sinking becomes drag and you know they've got to be a bit more dynamic moving up and down the boat to balance the boat um you know if you if you think about the extremes you have a very wide transom it's got lots of buoyancy in it you know the crew wouldn't have to go anywhere because the, the hull buoyancy will take it up if you've got a canoe stern a very small stern on the boat obviously if the um like hobie 16 is a good example Right, if you have I flipped over backwards on a one. Yeah. That was pretty dumb. Yeah, well, I've, I've always said, I hope the 16 is the only boat you can capsize in five different directions. <laughs> I've done six of those. Inwards. Right. And um, and that's the case. I mean, we've all done it. We're on a Hobie 16. You've been on a, a beam reach and you're sort of towards the back of the boat to keep the nose out. And suddenly, if you're a lake sailor, you sail into a bit of a hole. And immediately the transom sinks and you drag the whole boat back in on top of yourself. Well, that's the <laughs> ultimate extreme of a boat that's really quite difficult to sail. It's not very forgiving at all. So, right. so that, that was one of the things that we were building in the boat. So that it's not just transom size. That's how much rocking you put in the boat, um, how much volume you've got in the bow, how forgiving is it when you're pressing the boat really hard downwind. You know, if it's 20, 25 knots tied up downwind, quite a bit of chop around. You know, the most difficult time that you could possibly be pushing an F-18 downwind under kite. Um, how forgiving is the boat if it stuffs its nose into a wave? Is that going to be the end of the game? Or do you just pop out the other side and happily keep going? Well, you know, oh, about. for sure. Um, shout out to my buddy, uh, Michael Kucharski. We were, I took him out on my F-18. He's normally a Hobie 16 sailor. Um, we went out three up in just some absolutely insane conditions on Lake Michigan last summer. And... Uh, he his mind was blown as to what you could put an F-18 through that would just probably be suicide on a Hobie 16. Yeah, well, that's right. So so you can see what our aim was because the, the easier the boat is to sail, the faster yes. the boat is because the, the crew on board it can concentrate on where they're going. They can have their head out of the boat. They're, they're not sailing with a high degree of fear that that's all going to go pear-shaped really quickly. So they're actually racing the boat not just trying to survive so that's a big <laughs> yep. factor in um heavy air sailing but it's also true in light weather i mean a, a boat that that's got low drag the ends of the boat are clear of water you're not dragging your transom you're not being forced to sit a long way forward on the boat and be uncomfortable in your steering position and crewing position right all of those things matter in the light air as well so I mean, most people can design a boat that's nice to sail in 12 knots. That's pretty much a no-brainer, right? <laughs> but when you get to the more extreme ends of things, you still want the boat to perform. So you, you want a boat that's 
you know, at the, the best of its performance ability in five knots, and you also want a boat that's the best of its performance ability um, in 25 knots. And um, there's plenty of um, F-18 designs out there that have been good at one extreme end or the other, but yep. not too many that have been really, really good across the entire wind range. Um, all right. Uh, Dan Williams from uh, Kanoe, Hawaii asks, how much money was invested from the design to marketing of the Acura, and when will we see the first Acuras off the production line and shipped? There might be one for Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, just, we just spend it. Lorraine has to count it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a more difficult question. Um, <laughs> no, but it's it's always difficult to 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 have a full budget. Uh, uh, budget, sorry. I I think we don't count it really in money wise. We don't, we just try to. Um, I think we we try to uh, get it out over 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 time, and I think four to five years is a good time to uh, get more or less out of the cost of the of, of the molds. I think and, and, oh, the, 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 it's, it's a bit of a difficult question because you look at there's obviously the, the whole mold cost um, but there's things that are in the new boat such in the Acura like the, the dagger board which was updated three or four years ago and so sort of like well is that a part of the, the project cost for the Acura and so sort of like, well it's not that but, makes sense but we, we definitely designed the, the dagger board around the concept of going into the new boat so it's sort of like a I guess a new hull mold is a part of it, an evolutionary cost that we just always need to to keep a lid on and make sure that we're not overextending. And like Lawrence said, we need to be any any investment needs to be paid off um, within five years. And if if we can't justify it being paid off in that period of time, then we need to reevaluate the investment. So is, so it's almost like you were saying about the dagger board cost, that's really interesting, a, a really interesting note that you, so you were saying that the new dagger boards for the C2s were completely designed with the intention of using them for your next generation of F-18? Correct, yeah. Hmm, interesting. You know, at that stage, we weren't clear on exactly how far away that was, but it was definitely the, the, the idea. It also has uh, added benefits yeah. that extended the, the, the well, the performance life of the C2 as well, making those gradual improvements to the C2. There's not many um, F-18s out there that have actually been highly competitive for 10 years or more, and the C2 is one of those. That, you know, it's um, you know, it's it's still you know probably one of the most competitive F-18 designs around, um, and it's also probably the oldest uh, current C2 design around. So it's, um, you know, those gradual upgrades have um, served it pretty well. Yeah. I, I also think that it's difficult to put an, an exact cost at it as, because it's it's a continuous ev ev evaluation, like like uh, right. Greg also explained. You, you, you will always try to make the sales faster and try to get, get all the um, 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 benefits out of new design. So you always keep looking and sometimes you come to bigger design changes that might have a higher cost, and and, and sometimes it can be just a small changes that make things uh, move, move on. But I think it, it's 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 an, it's uh, as as we're we're all in a box rule and all in in a, in a, in, a, in the class. We we all want to move forward and we all want to have our boats go as fast as possible. So I I, I think it just makes sense to um uh, um uh, um uh, to um uh, try to. To 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 I mean, keep investing in a in a boat and a class, and as long as as we can um, uh, I'm gonna take it out over like Brett said, four to five years, I think it for 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 us it always makes sense, and and, and we just try to 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 keep going forwards. Okay. Um, Trey Sunderland of Mooresville, North Carolina, asks: Will the Acura have a single spinnaker halyard and tack, or will they be separate? Whatever he wants. <laughs> what's the stock on, or what's the standard or have you even so, set that it sounded like you were still working on the rig yeah so standard um on the the prototypes is going to be the, the two-line system um okay. there's a couple of single we had a single line system on the the capricorns and the bikers going way back when 
Um, we switched to the two line system. Basically, um, when all the T guys started coming across and they all sort of basically looked at us dumbfounded and they're like, why have you got a single line system? All the what guys? All the T, the tornado guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> obviously, when the tornadoes were dropped for the Olympics, a little bit before that, obviously, there were a lot in the F-18s. They sort of looked at it and went, this, the, the single line system is nice, but it doesn't give you the control out of your drops that they wanted. So that was... It's funny to see the, the circular thing about this, and I'll go on about this a little bit. But everybody kind of likes to re- reinvent the wheel, and when you're in the industry long enough, you kind of see these people reinvent <laughs> the wheel, and <laughs> you're sort of like, "Oh, great!" So 12 months later, you're back to the same thing that we did five years ago. But yeah, I, I've seen it come up in discussion, um, yeah. going back to a single uh, on the facebook groups and such and uh that's interesting to see that it's what comes around goes around and look i think we'd be um ignorant to to rest on our laurels and say oh we know better um we're definitely going to test um a couple of different uh single line systems on the prototypes um i'm actually setting up a viper this week um for myself for a regatta coming up and i'm going to put a single line system on that just to have a play with it again and and just re- relearn either the same lesson or possibly find something different. Um, <laughs> so I guess the, the answer is, is the systems um, will we'll always set something up as a standard, um, but we, we always encourage people to either with their dealer or on their own test and experiment and share, share their results because that, that's how we as a class and we as manufacturers learn, learn things. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Oliver Ludek from Montreal, Quebec asked, will it be foil convertible? <laughs> no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of strong feelings about that, but I didn't want to jump the gun. <laughs> yeah. Um, the foil convertible is, it's a fantastic concept. Um, and I think to be at the risk of sort of blowing our own horn, I think we did a really, really good job getting the C2 to, to a point where it could, could potentially be converted um, at very, very little detriment to its F18 performance. Um, but the fact is, is there's always going to be some level of, of compromise in there, either that um, forward location structure, because you've got to have a some form of a bigger case in there, um, which takes up weight, which then is taken away from other structural locations. So th- there's always a level of compromise in there. Um, and look, I think the reality of it was was that a lot of people liked the idea of foiling, um, but when when push came to shove, the the cost of conversion was, was such at a point where people weren't weren't willing to invest that sort of money. Um, yeah, and as not a foiler myself, but uh, around people who do have foiling boats, um, it seems like it takes a narrower window of what produces good foil sailing, and that window, at least here in Michigan, is something that we don't see yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, look, the other, the other I, I think with a, a fo- foiling F-18 is always going to be a slow foiling boat, right? The boat's actually too heavy. Um, it's just, it's just it's not, if you had a blank sheet of paper and said, I'm going to produce a falling boat, right? It wouldn't be an F-18 that you'd start with and work backwards, right? Yeah, and I think all we have to do is look at Phantom for that lesson. Yeah, well, well, they, that was a perfectly good example where they started like with an F-18 and said, okay, let's right. make a falling boat. It was a terrible falling boat. So they made <laughs> it wider, right? And they made the rig much more powerful. So that it was actually a power to weight ratio and leverage ratio. And that's what you really, really want. The, um, um, the the foils have become more sophisticated, so the technology in the actual foil section is better. A good example of, for us was we did the Viper when we actually sat down on paper and said, um, you yeah, know, what would be a, a, a good foiling boat? The Viper was a, or F-16 was a much better choice to start with because it was lighter. It was almost the same width as the F-18. Its power to weight ratio was significantly better. The writing moment that you could get out of the boat was also very similar to the F-18. So it just had ticked every box. And then when we did the foiling biker, it's actually proved to be an exceptionally good boat. Um, The thing to keep in mind with foiling, of course, is 
that hull length is not really relevant. It's a, a 16 foot foiling boat is probably just, or can be just as fast or faster than an 18 foot foiling boat. It's just all about the foils in the water and right. the leverage that you can generate to um, produce the power that's needed um, without an excessive tipping moment. So the yeah, F-18 as a foiling class, I don't think you're ever gonna see it take off. It's, there's other things that do it better. So one, yeah, I, I think it would be a huge detriment to for the F-18 class to consider that. I mean, I, all I, all we have to do is look at the A class and how there's classic and foiling, and and yeah. I like racing big fleets. <laughs> <laughs> I think the foiling kit was also a good example for us, where where we when we got at a point where we that was a design option. We thought that we would we wouldn't have our I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a design invention back in four to five years. So I think that's also a point where you just come and you just need to go. I think it's, it doesn't make any sense except of just have having fun. And of course, it's always good, but it all it also needs to make sense on a commercial side. Okay. Um, Jeff Garrett's from uh, Toronto, Ontario. Ask: Will there be a Will there be factory options? I know you guys have already mentioned paint color um, or a race package. <laughs> we, we, we build racing boats. There's no need to upgrade them. That's kind of what I thought. Um, <laughs> I bought well, my current boat for mum, so I had to give him at least one question. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's, two, there's two answers to this. There's, I come from a racing family where we get on a boat to go racing. Um, it was kind of like when I got my first minnow, which I guess is like a, a mirror or an optimus. Um, I think Greg spent probably four or five days optimizing every little part of this little minnow for me to go and sail around the lake. In. <laughs> so it's sort of what I've had since I was four years old. So it, it's it's unnatural to detune something. Um, and there's that, and there's also what actually happens is it becomes a false economy. You think by offering um, simpler side stay adjusters or a, a simple tiller extension or detuning a boat that it becomes cheaper. But from, a, from a, a commercial point of view, it actually doesn't work that way. And what it becomes is a, a marketing ploy to get people to spend more money. Um, so we, we, we discussed it a lot. And really what it came down to was like that we're, and I will swear here, we're a no bullshit racing producer that to try and detune something actually just costs money. So why would we right. tune it and then charge more to, to tune it up again? So we'll, we just offer the, the racing package from the ground up um, and we do so in the simplest, like Greg said, it's got to be the simplest and the most user-friendly option, which is the, the fastest option. So all of these things tick the box to not offer a, a racing package um, because what we offer already is the the bees knees racing package yeah yeah i'd imagine that it costs more to offer more options mm. yeah it does because if you offer more options you've got to throw away some gear that's already on the boat and replace it with the upgraded stuff <laughs> with the upgraded stuff the, the additional cost of doing that is quite small compared to adding it afterwards right 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 yeah, there is, there is, sorry, on that note, there is a lot of personalized options that we, we offer in the dealer's offer. So things like um, a few of the dealers have access uh, and offer um, uh, telescopic tiller extensions, adjustable trapezes. And, and these are things that we sort of identify as, as customizations, not necessarily racing package options, because like I know the likes of Glenn Ashby and Darren Bundock, they don't use adjustable. So I'll classify that as maybe it's not a racing option. It's a, it's a person personality preference, um, and we, we encourage and all of our dealers to offer those to customers on the on the shop floor. Okay. Um, this is a question that I, I thought was really interesting. Uh, Russell Gavlin of Fayetteville, North Carolina, asks: Is it easier to design an F eighteen or an F sixteen? Is there anything in the F eighteen class rules that is noticeably difficult to deal with as a manufacturer? Design-wise, it's pretty easy. You just find the scale. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, the F-16 is actually more challenging to design to. They've got a much lighter weight, right? So, in fact, 
historically speaking, the F8, sorry, the F16, um, the, the box rule for the F16 actually was evolved around a boat called the Taipan 4.9, which came out of Australia. Um, and when it first started, the, and the Taipan 4.9 was a, a basically a, a 16 foot um, A class almost to some degree, except that it could be sailed as a, a cat rig, you know, one sail, one crew member, or a two man boat. And then eventually mm -hmm. got a spinnaker added to it. But it was built by Jim Boyer, who was an awfully good craftsman building light, high performance boats. And it had a minimum weight that, in truth, for an F-16 class was just absurdly low and you couldn't actually build an optimised F-16 down to that minimum weight unless you went all carbon fibre and then the cost made it exorbitant and you couldn't <laughs> hold a boat. No one could afford to buy one. Um, <laughs> so with the F-16, um, it's got that issue of trying to build a minimum weight boat and it's also got the other issue that it's short. So if you want a high performance F-16 boat, um, that's going to perform downwind with someone out on trapeze pushing the boat to the limit. Very, very difficult to build a boat that doesn't want to just be like a submarine and head to the bottom in any <laughs> over 15 knots. And that was really the challenge uh, which we uh, um, met when we first designed the Viper. And it was the first boat in the F-16 class that in 15 knots plus was still a, a had the ability to be driven really hard downwind and consequently went on and I think won about seven world titles in, oh, wow. in the class. It was, it was almost unbeatable. For, well, for, it's still the, the dominant class in or dominant design in the F-16 class. No one's actually ever designed anything or built anything that is noticeably better. Right, so the, the ironic thing about it is when Greg rocked up in 2007, I think it was, to the World Championship with the prototype, everybody laughed at him and said it's too big. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah, too big, too stiff, too heavy, and then it went on. Too and... stiff, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what was said. Yeah, uh, that was what was said, but it, the long and the short of it is that it, it's a um, list of um, uh, titles that it's gone on to win. Uh, no other uh, F-16 design even comes vaguely close to it. So it's, it's, and it's still proving to be the fastest and the most durable boat. It's, you know, the life expectancy of an F-16 Viper is exceptional. You know, there's boats out there that are 10 years old that are still winning regattas. So um, it's been a good boat. So yeah, in, in a nutshell, the F-16 is hard to design too because the box rule um, it makes it more difficult. Um, uh, yeah, so the, there's nothing in the box rule that creates a major issue, certainly in the F-18. The F-18 is uh, quite a forgiving box rule to design within. Okay. All right, second to last question I have. Um, Ron Medlin from Wil Wilmington, North Carolina asks, in what conditions do you expect the Acura to be fastest? Do you have an estimated top speed? <laughs> Uh, I'll probably do 120 going down the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, kilometers or miles per hour? Yeah, I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> depends, depends, what the, depends, depends what the towing truck is in front of it. I mean, um, I've had mine up to at least 90 miles per hour. <laughs> um, look, like Greg said before, when, when we designed the boat, we definitely... Um, look, you, you designed for the range. Um, and you do, when you're sort of evaluating, you, you do look at the, the complete top end and you do look at the complete bottom end to make sure that you're not um, leaving one of those, those conditions out. So um, I think w when we've sat down and done this, we've, we've broad strokes from, yeah, look all the way from about five knots all the way through to 25, 30 knots. Um, wave, wave piercing capabilities in the ch short chop, big waves, things like that, they're all, all being considerations. So we didn't focus on any condition in particular. Um, and top speed of the hull, with that, again, that's a, we did do simulations on that, but it doesn't give you a, a top speed. Um, look, at, in the theoretical top speed will be higher than the, the, the C2. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting on that note, since the in, uh, inception of the deck sweeper, um, and this is, looking back over the last, say, five to six years. Um, in that time, I haven't actually been doing a lot of competitive sailing in the F-18. I sort of, um, you know, stopped sailing F-18s a couple of years back on the competitive side. 
Um, but the thing that I've noticed certainly from the coach boat is that the F-18s are actually going faster around the course. In fact, it's noticeably faster upwind. We've got some GPS figures from guys um, sailing at regattas where they've um, taken some GoPro video and their little GPS uh, mm -hmm. speedometer is in the bottom corner. And I'm actually astounded by the actual upwind speed that the guys are now doing with the deck sweeps on the boat. It's, it's, a, it's a solid lot faster upwind than what it was wow. five years ago. Um, and, um, and that alone makes a significant difference because when you're doing that sort of the, say, 12 knots upwind, okay, the hull's performing in a certain fashion, it's, it's significant the changes in drag factors when you just go one knot faster, 10% or 12% faster upwind makes a, a total change in how the hull drag is affected on the boat going through the water. So those things certainly come into it. So back to the question, does, did we design to try and improve things? Taking the little bit of rocker out of the keel line was certainly something we had in mind because that actually improves the, the actual maximum hull speed through the water, right? A flatter rocker is, you know, it's just been proven that that's what works. But um, <clears throat> the design of the, the foredeck for wave piercing, bit of extra buoyancy in the boat, uh, well, the overall increase in buoyancy is going to improve the light weather performance, but keeps the ends a bit more pre. The extra buoyancy up forward and the wave piercing of the bow improves the heavy weather. The larger transom and not dragging the transom in the puffy conditions means that we're better in those variable conditions where the, the wind is going from sort of 15 knots down to eight knots and then back up to 15 knots, you know, in, in puffy lake sailing conditions. So we've, we've aimed at improving Everywhere we could see there was a possible defect in the C2 as an optimised boat in any condition. We tried to address that and, uh, and improve it across the board, but certainly focused on the extreme ends of the conditions that you're sailing. You know, you've still got to be able to race the boat in 25 knots to win. And you don't, as I said before, you don't want to be just surviving in 25 knots. You want to be able to press the boat to the full extent of what your abilities allow. Cool. All right. Uh, last question I have from Andrew Fullhart of Elkhart, uh, Indiana. Um, what advantage do you feel the Acura has over other newer F-18s, including the Evolution, Sirius R2, and Scorpion? Oh, <laughs> that might, may, may not. The, the answer to that one will probably only come out over the next two years from the racing <laughs> um, every, Everyone that's that's designed or involved in building each of these different classes is certainly thinking that their design is probably the best. Um, you know, yeah, I wanted to hear what you why, why you think it's the best. <laughs> um, look, I suppose the answer is being the latest of the designs out, we've actually had the ability to sit back and have a look at what everyone else has done. Um, and just from our own knowledge of what we've done, we had, we had a very good starting point to have come from, which was the C2. With all the changes that have happened with rig developments and foil developments and uh, new designs out there, the C2, which was our starting base, was still as fast as any other class design or any other F-18 design that was, was currently in production, right? Um, so all we had to do is say, well, if we can make an improvement in performance over and above the C2, that means that we should be at the top of the <laughs> of the triangle of, um, of, of boat performance and design. There should be nothing that's going to rival what the Acura potentially can be. Now, the proof of that will only come about by the next year or two of racing results. And um, yeah, we'll have to see what happens. I think that's a solid answer without trash talking your fellow competitors. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I look to be, uh, we're pretty camp careful in doing that because everyone puts their heart and soul in it. It's a passion industry. Absolutely. Uh, I think if you're going to start um, trash talking competitors, then you go back to this tribal warfare game. <laughs> yeah, well, I just I thought it was a funny question to ask to see what you guys would respond. I like with. it. Yeah, it's good, <laughs> well, that's everything uh, um, that I was uh, that people pitched to me for questions and my own questions, and uh, this is has been an incredibly fun experience and. Uh, I look forward to, to sharing this. I, I think uh, the whole community around the world will be um, curious to see what you guys have to say. And I think we covered a lot of really good topics about it. Yeah, 
No, it was fantastic. In, in fairness, I think you were the, the right person for the job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank fantastic. you thank you thank you thank you okay thanks james